So one of the great joys of being a professor is, con- is conveying our love and our enthusiasm for the things that we do research on. And it's a mistake to think that we s- simply have to present this to a technical audience because, in fact, it's far more important that we reach the general public. And so about 15 years ago, I began teaching a course that we called Concepts of Science. And it was a survey of all of the important areas of science. And it was for, primarily for business and liberal arts majors. And we began with the Big Bang, we ended with macroscopic evolution, and we covered every topic in between. A lot of hot topics, you can guess just from that list. But of course, every year there are really important events that happen, you know, major weather events, maybe catastrophes, diseases. And so we focused each year, each time those would pop up, we would change the course a little bit and focus on those key topics. So the second year I taught the course, I walked in from temperatures greater than 100 degrees. It was actually the 10th consecutive day uh, that we were at those temperatures. And this was Alabama, and it was August, but it's not quite that hot there. And I said, uh, I said to the students, I said, this is the longest stretch in, in recorded history since we started documenting accurately the temperatures in Alabama that we've had this long of a stretch above 100 degrees. And I said, and I bet you think that sign, that's a clear sign of global warming. I said, but the heart of science is skepticism. And while it may be extremely hot here, we may be exceeding uh, all records, somewhere else it may be the exact opposite. It may be much, much colder than normal for an even longer stretch of time. So 15 years later, today, if I were to walk in from that heat and humidity, I wouldn't begin that conversation like that. Because there comes a point when you, you have to set the skepticism aside and you start to realize that the evidence has become overwhelming. We are experiencing uh, massive climate change. And one of the unfortunate things, it's fortunate for us, but from a perspective it's unfortunate, is in North America we've had very little of this. Uh, there have been major droughts in different parts of the countries, but in parts of Africa and especially in low-lying areas around oceans there are much, much greater effects. The heart of the problem is how we generate electricity. And if you look at this uh, pie chart, the bulk of our electrical energy comes from the burning of fossil fuels. In fact, most of it comes from burning coal. But if you were to sum up the burning of natural gas, coal, along with other petroleums, it totals close to three quarters of the pie of the total uh, electrical energy production. All of this generates carbon dioxide. It doesn't matter what kind of fossil fuel you're burning, uh, you're producing carbon dioxide. What you may not realize is that the entire energy landscape, at least in North America, is transforming without without us even knowing it. Fracking processes, which are being very much featured in the news, have made natural gas so cheap and so readily available that a lot of major companies that were very much committed to renewables and alternative energy generating technologies have given up because it's just so cheap to, uh, to derive the natural gas and to burn it. And the argument that's being portrayed in the media is that to generate the equivalent amount of electricity by burning natural gas versus coal, you actually only generate half the carbon dioxide. And I thought about that for about a second and I said, no, wait a second, half of many, many megatons is still a really big number. And so so I started thinking about all of the other energy options. As a matter of fact, I began fine-tuning the course that I was teaching to explore all of the ways we can generate electricity. And I immediately thought about hydroelectric. You don't see any uh, smoke rising from many towers. What you may not realize is that is one of the most catastrophic ways we damage the environment. Behind the Hoover Dam, one, uh, one of America's greatest achievements, there once sat something very similar to Yosemite, one of the most visited places in North America. It's now under hundreds of feet of water. That's the Colorado River, which many species used to migrate up and down. All of that is permanently damaged so long as that dam is in place. Some of you may have know, may have know of a similar catastrophe in China, the damming of the Yangtze River. It provides, I think, about 15% of China's electricity, but it's a catastrophic environmental uh, disaster. So I said, okay, we'll set aside hydroelectric. What about solar? Then you've prob- you face problems of a very diffuse form of energy, one that's only accessible in a limited number of areas, and the materials for generating solar power are actually not that environmentally friendly. What about wind? 
If you've ever seen wind farms, you know they're a giant eyesore. I saw all the huge wind farms in, uh, in northern Germany on the North Sea. Where, you know, they're planning on using these to replace the reactors in Germany that generate 50% of their electricity. You may not know, but in the back of that generator is the equivalent of a hybrid motor running in reverse. And to get to those motors to run, we need very, very powerful magnets. And they contain a hard-to-get-to element called neodymium, and almost all of that comes from China. That mining, and more in particular, the, the purification industry to acquire that, um, that element, is extremely filthy, and it is very damaging to the environment. So even wind is off the table. So I'm not picking on any of these in particular, except for fossil fuels. That's just bad uniformly. Um, so we don't have a good way of generating electricity. I know that may sound like a very negative thing to say, but in fact, that's a challenge to you. That's a challenge for all of you to solve. I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on nuclear energy, and I'll bet when I said that word nuclear, you automatically have this visceral response. You, you either see a glowing light or radiating you, maybe killing you on the spot, or if it's a more accurate portrayal, invisible rays passing through you, mutating your DNA, leading to a very slow and painful demise, okay? So, in fact, maybe you're thinking about barrels and barrels of depleted uranium. This is a real site, a real Department of Energy site complaining, uh, containing depleted uranium. There are nuclear reactors spread throughout the U.S. Most states have them, not all. Um, we have uh, more than 100 reactors in the U.S. There are more than 500 functioning uh, throughout the globe, and they've, some of them have been functioning f continuously, more or less, for more than four decades. In that entire period of time, there have been three major incidences. One took place when I was a child, actually very close to where I was living. It was at Three Mile Island, and it was just down the road in Hershey, Pennsylvania. That was actually the least significant, but it really alerted uh, the general public as to the dangers of nuclear power if it wasn't handled properly. When I was in high school, the Chernobyl event took place. This was a very serious event that created widespread um, nuclear contamination, contamination with fairly long-lived radioactive uh, elements. There were people that died as a result of that incident. The first responders, the firefighters that went in to put out the fire, um, they received lethal doses of radiation and they did die. Um, that event has been completely uh, misportrayed in the media. We were told... Uh, that the scientists running the reactor conducted an illegal experiment, that they shut off the water, completely allowing the reactor to overheat, and then turned it on, and there was a steam explosion. Turns out almost none of that's true. It was a bad reactor des design. There was a small team steam explosion, but there were also two nuclear explosions. So there can be very serious consequences um, for not generating um, nuclear power correctly. And then long period of quiet. So when I was in high school, it was quite a while ago, and I'll bet most of you didn't, you don't remember Chernobyl. It was before uh, you were born. So the nuclear industry realizes everything's good. They start talking about a nuclear renaissance. The first licenses in 30 years to, uh, to start new, new reactors occur. Uh, they're actually being built south of Atlanta. And then what happens? Fukushima. As a matter of fact, 10 years ago, I was interviewed, and they asked me, and they were thinking about California, actually, if an if a earthquake hits a reactor, will it blow up? And I said no. And as a matter of fact, it, they didn't blow up when the earthquake hit them. They blew up when the tsunami wiped away the backup generators and all the fuel to, to, to fuel the backup generators. Three days later, there were hydrogen explosions, not nuclear explosions. And so we're continuously reminded of the dangers of this way of generating electricity. But still, three events over many, many decades, hundreds of reactors. And so we have to ask ourselves, you know, which, just kind of pick your poison. Which of these do we want to do? What kind of damage are we thinking about? Because all ways that we generate electricity are bad. The advantage that nuclear has is, is that it is a very high density form of energy. Fuel rod assembly is only about this big. The amount of waste generated is actually relatively small, but most importantly, the carbon footprint, the amount of carbon dioxide that is generated as a result of 
of, of harnessing nuclear power is very small. We know what carbon dioxide is doing. We know how it is globally changing our environment. So we have to turn to alternative forms of energy. But none of us want this. None of us want a, a highly contaminated site as shown in this picture. And so many years ago, I became fascinated with the heaviest elements in the periodic table. Two of these you know. They're a part of, of everyday life. You know the names uranium and you know the names plutonium. Okay? Both of those are present in fuel. One of them builds up with time. Um, and the other one, um, the plutonium, you know primarily from, from nuclear weaponry. There are, in fact, much, much heavier elements than even plutonium. And in fact, the U.S. has a policy that is counterproductive, uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, we only extract about 1% of the usable energy from a typical fuel rod assembly when we, when we fission it. The problem is, as you break up the uranium into little fragments, some of those fragments ruin the fuel. In the 1950s, we recognized this, and we developed technologies for recycling the fuel. So you could reconstitute the fuel and burn it again and repeat these processes. That's called reprocessing. That's actually a forbidden word. I'm not supposed to say that because I'm funded by the Department of Energy. Um, <laughs> so all other nations that are nuclear-enabled reprocess fuel. They recognize how irresponsible it is to have a once-through fuel cycle. And so I decided I wanted to help the U.S. better harness our nuclear resources. And so I set out to accomplish, to accomplish a difficult goal. The really heavy elements, the ones beyond plutonium, they have names you may not have heard of before. The one next to plutonium is called americium. It's named after America. The one beyond that is curium, named after Madame Curie. Those elements also build up in fuel. They can be used as energy resources as well. We also have to uh, prevent their release into the environment if we store them in the long term. And so I started thinking about this problem, this very, very challenging problem, elements that behave very, very similarly. And I thought about the entire scientific method, and there's a certain flaw to it. When a scientist designs an experiment to explore how something changes as the function of a variable, we always ensure that we only change one variable at a time so that when we see an effect, we can tie it to that single change. The problem with that approach is it's a very slow approach. That's, it's methodical. It's very logical. It doesn't always get you what you want. And nowadays, there's a new word that's even worse than reprocessing, and that word is incremental. That is the very fastest way to get a proposal to the government to fund research denied. So we no longer want 1% improvements. Actually, in solar, they get real excited when there's a 0.1% improvement. That's not acceptable. We want 10% improvements, 20% improvements. And these require us changing fundamentally how we think about science. They're not going to come about by a systematic, stepwise development. They're going to require quantum leaps. And so I looked at these very heavy elements and I designed an experiment that didn't just change one variable. I took one small effect. Actually, I shouldn't say just me, my whole group. And we took this effect and we amplified it and amplified it and amplified it until we found these materials. And, and oh, there's a lot of very technical stuff up there, but the pretty stuff's along the bottom. We made these gorgeous crystals containing plutonium. That's the beautiful blue ones on the left, and americium. Curium is not so pretty, and even the heaviest element that you can work with in a laboratory, and FSU is the only place that has this element. Um, and we created materials that survived the radiation damage, that were able to prevent criticality events, and accomplished a lot of goals at once by not taking the in incremental approach, by designing a, a cascade series. We also discovered materials quite serendipitously, which is, by the way, how you get those quantum leaps. They're not logical extensions. We created this material from this, these same studies, these beautiful crystals, the beautiful colorless crystals in the, in, the upper, uh, in the upper screen. They trap, very difficult to trap, radionuclides, uh, ones that the Department of Energy has been, uh, is, has been unable to trap. And so I pose a challenge to all of you. 
We need better ways of generating electricity. Even the science fiction ways like fusion, there's a lot of myths about that too. We have sort of functioning fusion reactors. Pick an energy source and take it forward, not in a 1% improvement, in a 10% improvement, in a 50% improvement. Completely change how we think about our energy landscape and return to our commitment to the reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. Otherwise, this is going to continue to spiral out of control. Thank you.